The Cancer Assist Show, hosted by Dr. Bill Evans and brought to you by the Cancer Assistance Program. Help when you really need it. Well, welcome to the uh, Cancer Assist Podcast with Dr. Bill Evans. And I have a special guest today, Dr. Samantha Winemaker, who's a palliative medicine specialist uh, at the uh, University of McMaster and uh, in the Division of Family Medicine or the Department of Family Medicine and Division of Palliative Care, should have said that more correctly, right? And I'm delighted to have you here, Samantha, and it's, it's really great because we need to talk about palliative care because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about its place in medicine, how it's integrated into other specialties and so on. So we got a lot to talk about today, so welcome. Mm-hmm. We have to stop talking about it and start doing it. Well, there you go, because I, I think palliative care is probably about the most important thing that we can do for patients, because mm-hmm. most of the diseases we treat are chronic diseases, and so we're palliating people. And so all the specialties are, in fact, delivering some form of palliative medicine. And, and, and people shouldn't be turned off when maybe an oncologist says, well, I'm going to ask a palliative care physician to come and give me some help about managing your symptoms. And they shouldn't think, well, I, they're giving up on me. Um, but I think mm-hmm. that's a common reaction, that palliative care and the specialty is sort of re- equated with the end of life as opposed to improving the quality of life. Mm-hmm. It is definitely a loaded word, yes. and it has a lot of emotion packed mm-hmm. in there. And so we often refer to it as the four-letter word, palliative. (laughs) It is, the word itself is a huge barrier, and for most people, very meaningful. And so we're trying very hard to break that down. So are you trying another word, or are you just trying to educate people about (laughs) palliative care? I think the most important is to educate people Mm -hmm. about, um, you know, their own mortality, being woke about the fact that dying is a chapter in life just like being born is, just like going through menopause. You wouldn't have done that, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there are different stages we go through in life, and we have um, successfully pretended that we don't go through this one chapter called dying. And so it's really important, first and foremost, for us to be more woke about our own mortality, and then, yeah, start demystifying what this thing called palliative care or a palliative approach means in our lives. Okay, so let's start. with What does palliative care really mean? Yeah, well, you know, if we want to look at the most modern way of thinking about palliative care, we move away from just defining it as a specialty, like someone like me, a palliative care specialist that holds all the keys to these skills. Really, it's meant to be a philosophy of care or an approach to care that can be peppered into the illness journey right from the diagnosis of an illness that we know is going to be progressive, change over time, and eventually be life-limiting. Sometimes we misname these as chronic illnesses, but many of them are truly progressive and life-limiting. And so a palliative approach is something that any doctor, any nurse, any healthcare provider should know how, like I said, to pepper it in to the rhythm of their care just um, as a natural part of their skill set while they're balancing hope and reality of an illness. All of that's very vague. We can talk about how to operationalize that, mm-hmm, but, mm-hmm. but generally speaking, it's a philosophy. It's also a specialty. So there are people that are specially trained to provide palliative care uh, when things get complex. So I'm a palliative care physician. I'm part of an expert palliative care team. And if there are symptoms that are complicated or there are complicated discussions or complicated um, um, issues to sort out. We can be consulted at any time during the illness journey, not just at end of life, to help out. But between our consults, the regular care team is still providing a palliative approach. So it's an approach and it's a specialty. Gotcha. And it's often associated almost um, uh, in isolation with cancer, associated strongly with cancer as opposed to other types of illnesses, and that's a bit of a misconception too, is it not? Yeah, it is. And um, you're right. So palliative care is, like I said, about um, balancing hope and truth or hope and reality, uh, helping people to walk two roads or connect the dots of their illness. 
And so if we think about what illnesses have different chapters, where they go from the beginning, the middle, to an advanced or an end stage of life, there's many of them, more than just cancer. There's heart disease, lung disease, liver disease, kidney disease, pick an organ. Yes, pick an organ, <laughs> You exactly. know, dementia, ALS. Yes. There's many. I could probably rhyme off at least 18 of them separate from cancer. Right. So palliative care and a palliative approach is important for all, all of, of those people. I think people don't think of it that way, and it's really important to make that point that mm -hmm. there's palliative um, care for people who have chronic congestive heart failure mm -hmm. or chronic obstructive airways disease is yeah. some of the common things that one would see in the hospital, for example. So, um, and, and I think, too, that um, we maybe underestimate the amount of palliative care that goes on in the treatment of cancer. Now, I'm an oncologist, so I obviously think about cancer a lot. And as a lung oncologist in particular, my role principally in treating advanced lung cancer was to palliate people, mm -hmm. and particularly in the early days of my career because mm -hmm. we didn't have things that worked very well. So mm -hmm. we weren't lengthening people's lives very long, so we had to look after those symptoms that, that lung cancer patients get. Mm -hmm. But you do run into challenges as an oncologist of pain that you can't manage with the best techniques that you, you know we've learned as mm -hmm. oncologists, and that's often when the palliative care team could bring expertise in pain management mm -hmm. as, as an example, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, for complicated symptoms, when the usual team, for this case, the oncology team has tried the first and second line approaches to that symptom, and if they feel they're needing some help, that's exactly when you would consult a palliative care specialist. It's often been said that um, <laughs> a criticism of oncologists is that they leave involvement of palliative medicine physicians to when it's very late in the in the game so mm -hmm. to speak and that uh, really palliative medicine might be introduced much earlier in the course of it even the randomized trials showed that there was a survival benefit of involving mm -hmm. palliative medicine early in the course of people with advanced lung cancer mm -hmm. and so it's always been a kind of uh, challenge I think maybe it's partly due to the resources available but you know, oncologists would sort of treat, 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 manage some of the symptoms, and then refer to palliative medicine, sort of drop them over to a new specialty, mm -hmm. which is very awkward for patients, and mm -hmm. a, I think um, very disruptive to doctor-patient relationships, and patients may feel abandoned, and so on. And the notion of integrating uh, the palliative medicine physicians so they become, you know, familiar with the patient, the patient becomes custom to them and mm -hmm. so on seems to me a very good idea. Is, is that happening? Is it possible? Or we just have too few resources to make it happen? No, I, I definitely think it's important and possible. I think part of the problem is not that, it's not that we don't get palliative care specialists in early enough. I think it's what you said, Bill, which is this um, rhythm to the care, the vibe of the care um, coming from oncology where we're um, you know, infusing positivity and hope into the cancer journey, which is very important, uh, but there comes a time when there are cancers that are recurrent or they move through the stages and become more advanced that an oncology team has to begin to um, it, you know, introduce the idea that this is a changing landscape here with your cancer and that the goals of care might be shifting. And if those types of conversations start earlier on, it is much easier to introduce palliative care rather than what typically happens where we have toxic positivity, where we're saying, rah, 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 you can beat this. Oh, Mrs. Smith, you look good today. Oh, you just came out of the ICU, but aren't you looking good? And we keep cheerleading because we're only human as physicians. And we feel helpless sometimes when we can't offer things. So we offer first line, second line, third line, fourth line, clinical trials, second opinions, et cetera, et cetera. And then we say, you know what? there's nothing more we can do for you. I think we'll get the palliative care team in. Mm -hmm. And so the palliative care team coming in late isn't the problem. It's everything that hasn't happened before that point. That's the problem. Well, I confess uh, to being guilty. Uh, <laughs> You're <laughs> <I> absolved. <laughs> <laughs> but I think most oncologists feel they have to you know, sustain hope and uh, 
the next treatment's going to work uh, when the first one failed. And it's a difficult journey, but I think that somehow we need to help educate oncologists about how to have the conversations that, mm -hmm. you know, this, this is a journey that will end ultimately uh, in, in the person passing. Um, okay. But we're going to mm -hmm. do our very best to make, put that into the distance as best we can, but that's a reality that we're going to face, and we don't yeah. know exactly when it's going to occur. So. Um, or, or you could say, you know, um, we're going to be shifting now to a second line treatment, if if that's what you would like, um, and tell them all about the second line treatment, and invite them to um, know more about the what ifs. So. Um, not just the benefits and burdens of that particular treatment, but let's just say, can we walk two roads together, we might say to the patient, and hope that this next treatment works, but what if it doesn't? Can you and I talk about that? Let's talk about if things don't go the way that we're hoping. What will that look like and what will that mean? So we can hope for the best and plan for the rest, and we continue to do that as healthcare providers along the entire way. And that's the healthiest way to help shepherd our patients and their families through a journey of an illness that might have twists and turns, is not to pretend that those things will never happen because we want to instill hope. We can be hopeful and prepared simultaneously. Being prepared does not betray hope. Hope will naturally change along the illness journey if it's infused with reality. We do not want people stuck in a hope earlier in their illness, like hoping for a cure, if that's not possible. That's a wish. That's a miracle. That's a dream. But that's not a hope. So as healthcare providers, we have to invite people to know about the reality of where they're at in their illness so that this very important protective mechanism called hope can evolve and match where they're at in their illness. Because hope can stay high until the very end, but it changes its face from hoping for a cure to hoping for more time, to hoping for good symptom control, hoping that their family's gonna be okay. Hope can remain high and we can prepare at the same time. That's great. Now, where does that education of our oncologists occur? <laughs> or is it occurring? <laughs> like I can say in my career, it didn't occur. Um, and you just sort of learn in the school of hard knocks or the clinic. And, and you have experiences like where you tell a person that their disease is incurable up front, I'm gonna do my best to treat it, to control it, and they get angry with you. So when you have a few of those experiences as an oncologist, you sort of, mm, maybe I don't wanna tell them that it's incurable right up front, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so you, you sort of learn in the trenches uh, the skills that you apply for a lot of your career. They may not be the right skills mm -hmm. or the right tactics to use. And it seems to me we, we need to do a better job of, of just what you described. And, and uh, I, I just don't know that that's occurring. And part of the problem, of course, is like all of medicine, the amount of knowledge is exploding. So we try and cram more and more minutia into people's heads. And in oncology, the, the options for treatment are just uh, becoming innumerable. And it's hard enough to remember that, let alone to yeah. be really good at communicating to people about these really, really important matters for their life you know yeah and so as uh, treatments get more complicated and um, more in numbers we run the risk as healthcare providers of avoiding the big picture of the illness we get so focused on the weeds uh, and in the rabbit holes of <laughs> treatments and the options and it's dangerous because i think as healthcare providers we have to balance being in the weeds and rising up and looking at the big picture of what we're dealing with here, looking at the long view and helping patients and families with that roadmap. It's not fair to keep the patients and families in the weeds of treatment decisions without saying, would you like to know where you're at in your illness journey so that we can talk about this treatment in the context of where you're at? Physicians are only humans, nurses are only humans, we're all only humans. And it doesn't feel good to invite people into conversations that are gonna be tough. But information is ultimately power for patients and families. And there is nothing worse 
than patients and families feeling that they're floating along at the mercy of the healthcare system, not really understanding where they're at, not feeling anchored, and quite frankly, feeling lost, scared, and terrified. So as hard as it is for healthcare providers to have these conversations, they're extremely important, even though they can be upsetting. People are amazing and they will adjust, and they adjust better when they have real information uh, and factual and truthful and honest information. And they need to feel empowered that they can initiate the conversations themselves. Totally. So I, think, I think that's one of the issues that often in the context of busy clinics, uh, whether it's a cancer clinic or a cardiology clinic, the pressure and the waiting room that's full and so on makes people think that they can't raise something as mm -hmm. as important and probably time consuming as a discussion about mm -hmm. what's going to happen to the rest of my life and yeah. where am I at in my journey. And so those conversations don't happen. And the doctors, by the same token, uh, certainly oncologists these days are extremely busy in the minutia of all these complicated therapies mm -hmm. they have to administer takes up the time and then they They've got to worry about that busy waiting room as well. Um, mm -hmm. So taking the time to get into what is mm -hmm. a is a difficult um, and uh, careful conversation that needs to take yeah. place uh, that maybe they don't feel they've got the time or yeah. mental inclination to do at that moment. So I, I guess there's some some need for education and and on the on medical side, but there's a need for maybe helping patients to feel empowered to initiate the conversations. Oh yeah, that is uh, that's actually at the heart of um, this stage of my career. <laughs> I'm trying to leapfrog over healthcare providers and help the public understand that they have a right to ask these questions of their healthcare providers. What happens is that the patients are behaving and they're trying to be good patients and so and they can see that it's very busy. So they don't ask and they're scared of the answers as well. Yes. But they yeah. have a, a silence around them. And same with their healthcare uh, their caregivers. Then we have the healthcare providers who are tentative and busy and worried about making people depressed and sad. And so they're not inviting the conversations. And then between the two, we have a cone of silence. And then it becomes a huge derailing, upsetting conversation down the road because we didn't invite smaller, gentle discussions along the entire journey. It's true, it will derail a clinic visit if it's left too long. But oncologists do see their patients often, and hopefully over a period of time. And so they do have the opportunity to, if, if they learn how to do it and feel confident to do it, to infuse it a little bit into every conversation. It actually feels good from a healthcare provider. I'm a palliative care doctor. People say to me all the time, oh, you must be so depressed or you must be so depressing <laughs> to be around. I don't think I am and I'm not depressed and it's because I can um, easily and confidently get into these conversations and it makes me feel really good because I see patient shoulders relaxing, their faces relaxing. They thank me for being the first person to tell them what they've been thinking and wondering about. And that's a feel-good moment for a physician. And most physicians think the opposite. If I go into those conversations, it's going to make me feel awful. I'm protecting myself as a, a clinician, you know, because I'm busy, whatever. And they're worried that it's going to make the other person feel terrible. But both people feel better when we're more honest and truthful with each other. So how are we going to change this culture? <laughs> you said this is what you're this focusing on. This podcast is going to change the culture. <laughs> well, I don't think one podcast is going to change it, but I know you're doing podcasts to so try yeah. and change it as well. Mm -hmm. I, I do think conversations like this can be very helpful, and I do hope it's listened to by a lot of uh, individuals, um, because maybe that will get rid of the cone of silence to some degree. Yeah. And I do think there's, there's a learning curve certainly for oncologists, and I'm sure for all specialists, to, to try these conversations, perhaps tentatively, but uh, gain confidence over time by having mm -hmm. them so that they're not uh, feeling, well, I just better ignore it and wait till mm -hmm. I have nothing else to offer, and then I'll tell them I'm going to refer them to palliative yeah. care, uh, which is 
pretty much or commonly what's done. I wouldn't mm -hmm. say all the time, but mm -hmm. it's, it's too much of the time, let's put yeah. it that way. And you really need to see that change. I do empathize, though, with the on oncologists and per perhaps with others as well, just because of the what I know is an incredible caseload. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to, to um, think through how we can perhaps make the trend, you know, the, the have those conversations, but maybe not always with the oncologist, but other care providers could be more helpful in, in initiating them, perhaps the nursing staff, perhaps the social worker. Or, or their family know, doctor. Or their so, family doctor. Yeah, yeah, I mean, hopefully most people, not everyone, but everyone should have a family doctor, a family practice. And it's that person who knows them over hopefully a lifetime as well. And so they're in a perfect position, primary care, uh, to be able to have some of these conversations. So if I was an oncologist and I was too busy myself to have them, I might put in my consult note to the family doctor, I, I um, would recommend that you enter into a conversation with our patient about their goals of care or what's most important to them or, um, you know, I've had these discussions at the cancer center, but I'm leaving these ones to you. So I do feel it's um, reasonable to share these complicated discussions between multiple care providers. We just have to let each other know who's on first and who's on second. Right, right. Well, I'm also wondering, as you're saying that, one of the things that's going on at the cancer center right now is the implementation of a new information system, part of which is my chart, <laughs> which yeah. the patient will be able to access. They'll see the notes that their oncologist is dictating and they'll see the results of their tests and they may get a, a clearer understanding of where they're at by g going into their chart and reading those notes and perhaps be in a better position to ask ask questions or have the conversations it will be interesting over time to see how that evolves but i would assume that it would help to initiate some of those conversations yeah, I mean, it's definitely going to be um, a learning curve and a transition because I don't think we currently do our consult notes knowing that patients We're and gonna families are going to read them, right? And so, you know, we sometimes we put things like, and the angry wife said, you know, and <laughs> so we're, we're going to have to learn how to do our, write our consult notes differently uh, and be careful that if someone is reading the consult notes and we are putting the most honest and truthful information in there, that we do it in a way that um, at least helps explain things better. The meaning behind what we're putting in the consult note, I think has to be part of the consultation or patients and families will be left reading them, not knowing what does that mean? So. Yeah, I think that it's going to be interesting to see how it all unfolds. We're going to take a brief break now and come back in a few minutes to continue our conversation with Dr. Samantha Winemaker about palliative care. We'd like to take a moment to thank our generous supporters, the Hutton Family Fund and Banco Creative Studio, who make the Cancer Assist show possible. The COVID-19 pandemic has not stopped cancer. Instead, it has added to the isolation and challenges already faced by cancer patients and their families. The Cancer Assistance Program remains committed to providing free, essential support to cancer patients in our community, whether it be transportation and equipment loans, personal care and comfort items, to parking and practical education. With no sustainable government funding, we need your help so we can continue to be there for those who depend on CAP to stay safely at home. Individual and corporate support of signature events, third-party fundraising, and financial gifts are greatly needed. Visit cancerassist.ca to see how you can make a difference in the lives of cancer patients and their families. We're back with Dr. Samantha Winemaker talking about palliative care, and we were talking just before the break about um, my chart and how uh, patients will have more information about their their care, what perhaps their doctor is thinking, what he's recording in the notes, and about their lab work and other things, which may. Um, alert them to the fact that their clinical course is, uh, is perhaps not going as well as they would hope. And um, that may cause them to think about having a conversation with their oncologist. How would they initiate that conversation? What would they, what would they say or how would they you know, get their physician's attention, so to speak, to, mm -hmm. to get into the conversation? We, we, we know oncologists and others tend to want to avoid. Yeah. 
Okay, so first position yourself against the door. So that... <laughs> they can't run so away. So they can't run away, no. I'm only kidding. Yeah, it's really important for us to give patients and families. So we can't forget the families, right? Because sometimes mm. they're in the shadows of the patient and they have lots of questions but don't feel that they have the spotlight or the permission because it's all about the patient. But it's really all about the family, the caregiver, and the patient. They're a unit of care when someone has cancer. So we want to make sure that they know that they're invited to ask questions. But no one's going to give them that invitation in a busy clinic. So if I was a patient, I, and I'm first meeting my oncologist, I hope that I would be brave enough to say, well, hello, Dr. Evans. It's wonderful to meet you. Um, just so you know, I'm the kind of person who really likes information. I really feel better when I know everything that you know, um, for better or for worse, Dr. Evans. Like, you don't have to feel that you're going to hurt my feelings or make me sad. I'm a control freak, Dr. Evans. Like, you're going to make me feel worse if I don't know what you know. So I think patients need to bring themselves to their appointment and almost like you have a terms of reference or a CV or a resume and you tell your doctor how you want the rhythm of your relationship to be. Doctors are waiting for permission to speak openly. So one of the best things that patients and families can do is just say to their doctor, please don't sugarcoat things for me. I really want all the information frankly and upfront. A patient might not want that though. Yes. Let's say a patient mm -hmm. is the kind of person who doesn't it, walk that way. They might say, you know, I'm scared Dr. Evans, um, but I am a planner and I have family members um, who are going to want to know things. Uh, I'm not sure when I'll be ready or if I'll be ready but my wife is gonna to wanna to know everything. So they can present someone in their family who's going to be that person who's in the know. All we need is one person in the know, in the informal crew, uh, so that this journey um, is a woke journey. If it's not the patient, it needs to be someone very close to them who's willing uh, to have more honest, frank information. So I'm glad you made that point because I, I, I've certainly met the kind of patients who say, lay it all out for me, doctor. I actually think they're probably in the minority in my experience. A, a, a lot of people I think are just hesitant, and, and but I think there's definitely a group that don't want to know this. People are people. There's a spectrum of, of uh, ways of living your life and managing information about uh, the things happening to you. Um, but I think that the that somebody <laughs> needs to know in the family unit, and I always felt that as as uh, things were deteriorating, if the patient was in a position to receive the information, I always wanted to make sure the family is well informed mm -hmm. because an ill prepared family for the decline in health is just a, just a very sad uh, thing to it's witness horrible. because they have no no chance to prepare. Mm -hmm. Uh, to ready themselves for it, and it can come as just like a lightning bolt all of a sudden, and mm -hmm. it's, it's destructive. And it has something to do, I guess, with the grieving process, mm -hmm. which isn't a, a sudden thing. It's a gradual process, isn't it, mm -hmm. uh, grieving? Yeah, I mean, the word grief sounds like it's a horrible thing, but just like we spoke about hope, grief can be a very important protective mechanism while someone is looking down the pipeline of a progressive illness. There is something called anticipatory grief that happens along an illness journey to the patient themselves or their family members as they begin to move through the chapters of an illness. They begin to um, prepare for losses and move through different losses in their illness journey, almost like building a little bit of a, a, a tough shield around them to protect them for what they know is coming. If we do not help people understand their illness in a truthful way, then they continue to journey in, let's just say, a fantasy world. And that normal grieving process that's protective never has an opportunity to evolve. And down the road, when the rug is pulled from beneath them, they suddenly start grieving, either right before the person goes 
or the family starts right at the loss. And then we're more likely to have a complicated, shocking, emotionally um, laden grieving process that could have had a softer landing if we let grief evolve, just like we let hope evolve along the way. I think there's a very practical side to, to it as well, because if, if you live in this fantasy world that you're going to be cured, <laughs> uh, and you've been buoyed up by all the hope that the doctor's been transmitting to you, perhaps falsely, you don't have the conversations with the family they might otherwise have done. You may not have made the necessary preparations for your finances, mm -hmm. or you may not have given some special thing to your granddaughter, and all these little practical mm -hmm. things that people, when they know uh, that their t time is finite and getting shorter, they would take on to do and, mm -hmm. and, and leave some of the legacy mm -hmm. that they want to leave to their family. You know, when I think about it, because I'm immersed in dying <laughs> all the time, I know for me, uh, I definitely would want to know if I was in my last year of life. Uh, I would want to be in the driver's seat of my last year. Uh, whatever it means, like the things that you mentioned, like it is my life, it is my last year, and it's not for someone else to decide when I should know that or not. Um, so most people, unlike your experience, but most people in my world, the patients and families that I meet, say, are you kidding me? Of course I want to know. Very few people who I meet say, no, no thanks, keep it to yourself, I don't mm. want to know. The majority of people say, if you know something, I want to know it. And they might want it very gently, but they want to be in the know. Most people don't want blindfolders on. Most people actually assume that what you're going to tell them is going to be a horrifying story. When people actually allow you to explain what moving through the chapters of an illness looks like, what the dying chapter looks like, what the entire last year might look like, people are often very surprised that it's so much better than they ever imagined. People imagine that they're going to have horrible pain. That's on mm -hmm. everyone's mm -hmm. mind. But if pain wasn't part of your illness along the entire way, it is unlikely to rear right. its ugly head at the end. Yes. <laughs> at the end. Yeah. Just because people are dying in the last months or weeks or days of life does not mean new symptoms usually crop up, like suffocation and choking and pain and all of these things. The main symptom of dying is fatigue and weakness and just running out of gas. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it is itself a very gentle process. And most people um, say, articulate, that they would like to die at home, and mm -hmm. yet we are a culture that <laughs> doesn't seem to enable it very well, does it? And more deaths occur in hospital than at home. And, and how, I, I think you have a lot to do with patients in their homes mm -hmm. and, and with their deaths in homes. And how can we do that better from your experience and make that more the norm rather than hospital deaths? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm like a broken record, Bill, sorry. Uh, but it is, you know, in order for someone to have a successful home dying or home death, uh, there needs to be certain ingredients. And one of the ingredients is that the people have real information. It's not fair to say we're discharging someone home from the hospital because that's what they want without helping them understand what it's gonna look like as things unfold. So people need a roadmap of what their illness is gonna look like as things change. Caregivers need to know what that's gonna mean on their end. And everyone needs information because if they don't know what it's gonna look like and they don't know what to anticipate, then everything they see, because things do change, will seem like a crisis. And they will be constantly thinking that, oh, this person is getting so tired, 911. Oh, this person is not eating very much. In fact, they're not eating 911. Everything is 911 if you didn't have someone describe to you what is the normal course of things going forward. So the first ingredient is information. The second ingredient to be able to be at home is that you have someone in your life to attend to you. So there mm -hmm. is 
you know, as things change and people get weaker, necessarily they need more help with their personal care. And so there is a certain amount of home care people can get at home, but it does require someone else to fill in the gaps because it's never 24 seven home care. You need a person, either a family member, a friend, a neighbor, um, uh, you know, whoever. You need someone to be able to attend to you. Again, you might say, but what if someone has no one? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know that's what you were gonna ask. <laughs> um, well, then all the more reason why we have these conversations earlier so that we're not left at the 11th hour identifying that someone is about to lose a lot of energy and need help with you know, bathing and dressing and has no one in their life. These are not the things we wanna scramble to do at home. So in order to keep people at home, we have to shine a spotlight on community care, on home care, we need to resource it properly, and we need to inform patients and families what that looks like at home. I've seen lots of beautiful, beautiful deaths at home. It can happen, but it's more likely to happen if people know what they're getting into. Of course, there's also the option of hospice. Yeah. And, and why choose one over the other? Uh, mm -hmm. Is it just personal it's very choice? Personal. Uh, yep. Don't feel that they want to die in their own home and maybe leave a feeling for their, their spouse that yep. that will linger over them and have a negative impact on their life. Is it better to die somewhere else or yep. it's ideas a like that? Very individual uh, decision. Uh, some people decide for those reasons. Some people decide they want to go to hospice because they're for some reason scared. Uh, either the patient is scared or the family is scared and they prefer to be somewhere where there's trained professionals around 24 7. Some people go because the family has become exhausted becoming the care mm -hmm. team. Mm -hmm. We turn families into doctors, nurses, pharmacists, mm -hmm. social workers, OTs, PTs, dietitians, PSWs, chaplains. We turn them into the team when people are at home. And it can be exhausting. And so that could be one reason that we no longer want to be that team. We want to be the wife. We want to be the husband. And we want to be by the bedside and not be task oriented. Um, sometimes there are symptoms that cause, or we can anticipate might cause a rocky road. And for those reasons, sometimes people go to hospice because they can get care quite quickly if it's right, needed. Right. So there's sense. lots of different reasons, yeah. and there's no judgment, and there's no right or wrong. But it's all the more reason why we need these conversations, right? To, yeah. to have people lay out, uh, well, the, the professionals lay out what may be ahead for the patient, and mm -hmm. the patient and family lay out what they can do, what their resources are, what they're comfor comfortable with, et cetera, mm -hmm. and, and make an appropriate decision for that particular individual. Mm -hmm. Now, this made the... Um, need a bigger conversation maybe it's another podcast but uh, in, in society we're seeing more and more people choosing the time of their death by medical assisted um, death and uh, I, I recently had uh, a couple of individuals close to me who've chosen that route and I it's been an interesting learning I, um, I as an oncologist with that all that hope <laughs> part mm -hmm. <laughs> it uh, it uh, kind of goes against my uh, my, my, my philosophy, I guess, but uh, I, I found that these these deaths were very good deaths, and the families were very comfortable with the the dying process. So it's been kind of educational to observe them. But what's your what's your view of uh, made medical assistance in dying? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's been legal for some years now, so it is here. Uh, I would say, you know. If I'm being honest with you, since the day I graduated as a palliative care doctor, uh, I have been asked from patients and families to end their life. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't come as a request for MAID because that wasn't the term they used. It wasn't legal. They would say, you know, where's the pillow? Did you bring the gun? Uh, <laughs> did you bring the injection? So as a palliative care doctor, I have been very comfortable receiving that request since my graduation. Of course, I couldn't act on it, but what I was uh, forced uh -oh. to do, not forced, was to sit with the patient and family in their suffering and unpack it 
and try to understand where their request was coming from. And I will share with you that nine out of 10 times the request fizzled when the patient was invited into open, honest discussion about their illness. They would say, oh, I had no idea. You're kidding, that's what natural dying looks like? I didn't know. I wanted the pillow because I just assumed that my head was gonna pop off. So there are a lot of misconceptions about what dying looks like. And often that's the driver for assisted death. We need to be very careful, all the more reason now with MAID being legal, that we help citizens understand what natural dying looks like so that they can truly make an informed decision about which road they want to go down. They need to be described in great detail what is a death by MAID, what does that entail, what does it look like. In addition, they need to know if you don't get MAID, this is what dying looks like. These are what supports are available to you. This is the role of hospice. And this is what doesn't happen in a natural death. And then they can say, okay, this is the road I choose. So my real issue is that patients who are contemplating medically assisted death need to make sure that whoever is assessing them for that also explains to them what the other road looks like so that they have a very clear idea of both roads. And you and I just spoke for an hour about how healthcare providers are uncomfortable talking about normal dying. So we need to be very confident that the MAID assessors and the MAID providers have the language and the skill to be able to shepherd people through that decision making that needs to be really informed. It's very interesting because it, it, uh, it kind of reinforces a belief I've had which in part is that society pressed for MAID because of a failure of us to have those conversations and to practice good palliative care. Had we done a really good job of pain management and having discussions about what end of life looks like, I'm not sure we ever would have got to MAID. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, is, is it really always necessary or is it necessary as it's occurring? I, I, I would question whether that is, is, is the case. So that's, that's very interesting, your observations on it. I, I think this conversation has been really um, yeah, not only interesting but very instructive and even this old dog is learning new tricks here. I think if I were practicing, I'd want to go back to the clinic and put them into action immediately. But I hope those listening are uh, picking up on this and uh, will employ it in, in, their, in their practice. Um, Samantha, are there any sort of final thoughts you might have that you'd like to um, leave our listeners with about mm -hmm. palliative care and the role of palliative medicine and medicine overall? Yeah, I think I would say to and you know the, to the listeners, um, don't be passive in your healthcare journey. Move from the back seat into the front seat and be um, respectfully assertive. Uh, there's nothing worse than going through a journey and being at the end and being frightened and scared uh, because you didn't get the information that you need. So, the way of the world in healthcare right now is that patients and families need to find their voice and to speak up. It's not good enough just to say, you know, the doctor knows best because you know you best and bring yourself to your appointments. Fantastic message to leave our listeners with. Thank you so much for um, participating in this podcast, The Cancer Cyst Show with Dr. Bill Evans, and we'll be back uh, next month with another show. Uh, and if you um, enjoyed this and found it informative, you may want to also visit the Cancer Assistance Program's website because we have all of our past podcasts available there, and you may find one that's of relevance to you as well. But this one with uh, Dr. Samantha Winemaker, I think, has been an exceptionally good one. So thank you so much for listening, and thank you so much, Dr. Winemaker, for being here today. Thank you, Dr. Evans. This has been the Cancer Assist Show brought to you by the Cancer Assistance Program. Thanks for listening.